Welcome. It's good to be back. It's uh, you're gone for a week, and it's amazing how long a week can feel sometimes. Um, we uh, we weren't even able to go to church in uh, Thunder Bay because you had to sign up, and uh, we weren't able to sign up uh, because we came from out of province. So it is really good to uh, be with you this morning. Uh, we received a gift from you as a church yesterday, Joyce and I, and uh, we uh, just want to thank you for that as well. Um, it was a gift of plants, so Joyce truly uh, loves those, and um, yeah, it's just, uh, we thank you for your, uh, for your yeah, gift of appreciation, and just want to let you know that you know, we feel privileged and honored to be part of of the Bethel Church family as well. If you are a guest this morning, uh, we are celebrating the Lord's Supper. So for those of you who are at home and uh, worshiping with us online, um, this might be a good chance for you to maybe pause the video and get the materials as well. We, uh, it's Reformation Sunday. How many of you um, thought about the Reformation uh, this week? I see some hands. Um, yeah, a Reformation Day Sunday, a day where we, um, it's, it's Mixed Blessing Sunday. It's a Sunday where we, where we remember that uh, God renews his church uh, and that we are called to follow him alone. Um, but it's also, also the beginning of a whole lot of church splits as well. And uh, so that's why it's a, a Sunday where we, it's a little bit bittersweet. Uh, the church was broken in many ways, um, the broader church, um, but it also brought us back to who we are as a church, following Jesus as our Lord and Savior, um, and trusting in him alone, and that uh, it's not by anything we do, uh, but it's all through God's grace that we, uh, that we are saved and called to be his children uh, as well. And this is why we light a candle. It reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world, but also that we're called to be light of the world. And we do that by following Jesus, loving each other, serving our community, and sharing our faith as well. So as we come into worship, uh, let's come into worship with a word of prayer. Holy God, your power fills the universe with light and love. Your tender hand caresses those who are suffering and wounded. You welcome strangers and care for the lonely. We are awed by the amazing extent of your compassion. So we ask you to meet us where we are. Speak to us in ways that we understand. Come to us, O oh God, in our time of worship. Still our hearts and minds. Renew our spirits and fill us with the life that only you can offer. And God's people said, Amen. I invite you to stand for the call to worship. So God has called us here this morning to this place where we hear those stories which show us what the kingdom of God is like. God summon, uh, summons us to this place where we can learn how to serve our God without reservation or hesitation. And God will send us from this place as well to tell others of God's hopes and dreams so they too can choose to follow God. And God isn't a God who's far away. Our God is right here. He is with us this morning as we come to his house and he says, it's great to see you, my children. And he greets us with these words from Scripture. May grace, mercy, and peace be yours today and always from God our Father and Jesus the Christ through the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen. And as God has greeted us, I invite you to turn and just give each other a thumbs up. Say hi to those who are at home worshiping as well and to all the guests. And now we have an opportunity to join together in singing for the beauty of the earth.
this isn't. The Lord's Supper is one of the one of the ways, one of the things that got changed in the Reformation. In the Middle Age, in the Church of the Middle Ages, and before the Reformation, we were only able to take the bread, and only at special times were we able to share in the wine or the juice. Um, in the Reformation, the Reformers said it's important that we that we partake not only of Christ's body, but also of his blood, uh, and that this is for everyone. Uh, it's for all of us. And that's why if you are a guest this morning and you're wondering if you should partake, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you trust in him alone for your salvation, if you're sorry for your sins, uh, if you desire to live in obedience to him, you are welcome to join us, for this is God's table, and it is meant for his children as well. And as our Lord's Supper liturgy this morning, uh, we're going to turn to the Heidelberg Catechism, and we're going to turn to question and answer 75, 76, and 77 to lead us into uh, the Lord's Supper. Now, the Heidelberg Catechism was meant as a teaching tool. So the teacher, the pastor, would ask his students, would ask the congregation, you know, what do you believe in this or in that? And then the congregation or the students would reply back. So that's how we'll do it this morning as well. So how does the Lord's Supper remind you and assure you that you share in Christ's one sacrifice on the cross and in all his gifts. Wait. Christ has commanded me and all believers to eat this broken bread and to drink this cup. With this command, he gave this promise. First, as surely as I see with my eyes the bread of the Lord broken for me and the cup given to me, so surely his body was offered and broken for me, and out for me on the cross. Second, surely as I receive from the hand of him who serves and taste with my mouth the bread and cup of the Lord, given me as sure signs of Christ's body and blood, so surely he nourishes and refreshes my soul for eternal life with his crucified body and poured out blood. So what does it mean to eat the crucified body of Christ and to drink his poured out blood? It means to accept with a believing heart the entire suffering and death of Christ and by believing to receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. But it means more. Through the Holy Spirit, who lives both in Christ and in us, we are united more and more to Christ's blessed body. And so, although he is in heaven and we are on earth, we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone and we forever live on and are governed by one spirit as members of our body are by one soul. And where does Christ promise to nourish and refresh believers with his body and blood as surely as they eat this broken bread and drink this cup? The institution of
which we give thanks, participation in the blood of Christ. And it's not the bread that we break, but participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one hope, the healing for our many, our own body, for we all partake of one hope. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup for which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, The Lord has prepared his table for all who love him and trust in him alone for their salvation. If you are truly sorry for your sins, if you desire to to live in obedience to him as Lord and believe in the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you are now invited to come with gladness to the table of the Lord. For these are the gifts of God and they are for the people of God. And I would invite the elders to come forward at this time to serve you. We have both wine and juice, and uh, Elder Jan has the gluten-free bread, and, and Elder Andrew has the regular bread. So we would ask you to come up a couple of rows at a time, beginning on this side. Uh, please come, receive the elements, and then return to your seat, and then we'll do uh, the next few rows. So if you'd like to come. And if you are unable to make it to the front, uh, just let us know at the end and we will come and serve you in your seat.
shed for you, Andrew. Blood of Christ shed for you, Lee. The blood of Christ shed for you, Leon. Are there others who still need to be served? The body of Christ was broken for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. So take, eat, remember and believe that the body of Christ was broken for all our sins. blood of Christ was shed for each one of us. So take, drink, remember and believe that the blood of Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. And in response, we will sing, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
I have the privilege of mentoring a student in Taylor Seminary, and we were talking this week about uh, worship and how worship is different from one church to the next. And she asked, what is, what's, makes our reformed worship uh, different from others and I said because we're in a conversation we're in a conversation with God we speak to God and God speaks back to us and that's how our service works and in our service also we speak with and for each other as well and she told her professor that and her professor said that's one of the beauties of the Reformed faith, is that there is this whole idea of being able to talk to God, but then also taking time to listen to God. So we have an opportunity to talk directly to God in prayer this morning. And we'll be asking for, um, for yeah, um, for blessings on some who are struggling in, their, uh, in health and different areas. But we also have an opportunity to give thanksgiving as well. And last Sunday, as I was in Thunder Bay, I received an email early in the morning um, from Adam. And Adam and Heather had a baby girl uh, last, uh, last Sunday morning. So uh, it wasn't able to be shared with you then. Uh, so it's a little girl, Eleanor Jane. I believe, and uh, was six pounds, and I don't know how long. I, uh, but, uh, but you can congratulate uh, uh, Adam and Heather, uh, or congratulate parents and, uh, uh, and uh, aunts of uh, this new uh, beautiful baby girl as well. So we'll give thanks for, um, for her as well. So let's come to our Lord uh, in prayer. Lord, thank you that we're able to come to you and to talk with you. That's one of the beautiful things about family is that you have opportunities to just sit and to talk. And sometimes we don't even have to talk. We can just sit with each other in silence and just being together um, is, is a beautiful thing as well. There's something special about uh, being able to, to talk or just to listen or just to be in, in each other's presence. And Lord, that's, that's what we're doing right now. That's what we've been doing this whole morning as, we, as we've been worshiping you, we've been talking with you, we've been hearing you tell us in the Lord's Supper about how much you love us, how much your Son loves us, and encouraging us to to receive that love and to let it shape our lives. And, and Lord, we also, as we got up this morning, it was chilly, um, but we also were reminded that in the changing of the seasons that you're in control as well. And while most of us aren't quite ready for winter yet, we, uh, we accept it and we receive it and we marvel at the beauty of uh, the snow on the ground and uh, and we enjoy the Christmas of the air as well. And Lord, we, we come to you and, and we confess that we always, haven't always measured up to who you want us to be, who you call us to be. You've given us a way to live and a lot of times we, uh, we say, no, it's, it's okay, I'd rather do it my way. But, but Lord, we do take time in this prayer as well just to say, um, Lord, we admit we messed up. We admit that we've sinned. Um, we've done things we shouldn't have, and, and there are times when you wanted us, you gave us opportunities to act, and, uh, and we couldn't be bothered. So, Lord, we take a moment in silence, and we just confess our personal sins to you right now. But Lord, we confess knowing that you love us, knowing that you've gone way beyond love in giving your son as a sacrifice so that we could be made right with you, that our sins could be washed clean, that we could be made holy in your sight. And Lord, we thank you for that gift of Jesus Christ. We thank you for, for the love and the obedience he has for you and the love he has for us. 
And Lord, we ask that we might live according to uh, who you call us to be, how you've created us to be. And Lord, you also tell us that we can come to you and we can ask for, for help. We can ask for uh, things that we need. And Lord, there are many struggles going on uh, in people's lives. There are those who are struggling with their health, and, and we think of uh, Clarence's brother Cor and Doreen's sister. There are so many who are uh, struggling silently with stress and worry. Lord, they're, they're unable to cope well with life, with self-esteem. Lord, there are those who are in our community who live in, in poverty and, and sometimes go hungry. And there, as we are being reminded um, often lately, there's a growing number of people who live in abusive situations because they're wrestling with mental health or, or they're wrestling with addiction or so many other things. Lord, we pray for, pray for safety for uh, for these people, we pray for healing for those who are wrestling with health, whether it's mental or physical or spiritual health. And Lord, we, we just take a moment in silence again to lift up the needs of people around us um, that others of us might not know, but that we do, and we place them in your hand. And Lord, we, we also acknowledge the many things we can give thanks for. We give thanks for, for the gift of a beautiful daughter to Adam and Heather. Lord, they, they named her Eleanor. What a, what a beautiful name. We thank you for the preciousness of, of life, of new life. And we thank you for the opportunity to be able to share our faith and to help others to, to know your son, Jesus. We give thanks for the simple things like warm homes and, and for strong families. We give thanks for the Lord's Supper and the gift of the Holy Spirit that keeps drawing us closer and closer to Jesus, reminding us that we are your precious children, but also challenges us to continue to grow more and more into the people that you've called us to be. And Lord, this is why we also pray, lead us not into temptation, but keep us from the power of Satan. And Lord, we do this all for the glory and honor of your name, not for ourselves, uh, but to remind ourselves of who you are, uh, but also in our prayer, in our lives, that we are a witness to you. So Lord, we ask for your blessing, that we may be a blessing. We pray this all in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So for those of you who are still in school, what are some of the things that you have been learning lately? What are you studying in school right now? I couldn't hear, sorry. Oh, okay. That sounds like fun. <laughs> How about some of the others? What are you learning? Governance? Okay. That's a really interesting topic right now with the elections going on all around us. Um, yeah, I would love to sit in some of those classes and hear some of the discussions. <laughs> How about others of you? What are you learning? Weather? weather? Uh, yes, this has been the week to study weather. Have they told you why it got cold so fast? No. Oh. I gotta, I, we got to study how we can get this place warmer. It's, uh, yeah, there's so many things to, uh, to learn 
so many things to teach. But do you know that God says teaching is really important and that even in the church. But it's not just you as students who uh, have to learn. That even the seniors here, your grandmas and grand, uh, grandpas, your omas and opas, uh, your moms and dads, uh, they all need to keep on learning as well. Uh, and who do you think teaches them? Grandmas and grandpas, how do you learn? Who's teaching you? Through life. Through life, okay. Others. Through others, yeah. From our parents, yeah. Even our parents who, who are no longer with us. Okay, God's word. Yeah, lots of ways that even our seniors, our grandmas and grandpas and omas and opas and pakas and bepas are, are still learning. And then... Who do you think they should be, who do you think they're teaching? Okay, the younger people. You know, I have, I have somebody who teaches me. I meet with him every Thursday at uh, around lunchtime over Zoom. And he's teaching me, um, we're talking about sin and we're talking about justification and a lot of big churchy words. Uh, but really we're talking about our relationship with God and, uh, and then how I can teach others and share others with others um, who God is and how they can teach God. So we always keep on learning and we always are called to keep on teaching as well. So as students right now, some of the older students can teach younger students. Uh, but even some of you who are uh, a lot younger, uh, maybe there's opportunities for you to share with your friends, teach your friends about um, maybe about who Jesus is or maybe about teaching them maybe they're doing something that they shouldn't be doing and you can teach them, you know what, Jesus really wants us to live like this. So there's always, we're teaching and we're learning uh, and we do it no matter how old we are. And that's kind of a cool thing about life, because when you stop learning, life gets really, really boring. And, uh, and I can share that, because I took a year off one time from learning. I just said, I have nothing left to learn. And I just found myself going, ah, oh, you know what? Uh, if there's nothing left to learn, uh, why am I even around here then? So then I got reminded by a, a gentleman whose name is John Stott. Now, some of the older people here might learn. He's in his 90s, and he said, I'm learning something new every day from the Word of God and from the people that I talk with. Uh, he said, I just had to learn to open my heart to it. And I hope you open your hearts uh, to learning uh, and then to teach others as well. So let's pray, and then we're going to hear the Word of God uh, read. Uh, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you gave us minds and hearts that no matter how old or how young we are, uh, we can keep on learning something new, something more every day. Uh, that your, your word, um, it, it, it just reveals something different all the time. Uh, something that we may have known once but forgotten. Um, but Lord, we, you keep revealing yourself to us. But then you gave us a whole creation uh, to learn from learning weather and learning art and learning governance and so many other things. Uh, and Lord, all these things help shape our hearts and lives and souls. So thank you for the ability to learn and for the ability to teach. Uh, amen. And next week, uh, I have a special children's message. Um, during the summer, I had asked... Um, People, if you had uh, something that you would like to draw or to write or something about the sermon at the time, and, uh, and one of you did, uh, one of the young people did, and uh, they gave me permission to share it as well, so I'm going to share it as part of the children's message uh, next week. Uh, so it's really something super special. Uh, but now we're going to turn to something really special. We're going to turn to the Word of God. From Titus chapter 2, the entire chapter. Right living in the church. 
You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanders or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back, not to steal from them, but to show them that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purity for himself, a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. The very words of God. Thanks be to God. Lord, we've had the opportunity to worship you and to talk to you and listen to you in so many different ways this morning already. And Lord, I pray that this whole time of worship may sink deep inside of our hearts and souls and minds to, to shape us and to form us more and more into the people you've created us to be. And I pray that the words which are going to be spoken next, Lord, may they be your words and not mine. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When I look at Titus, how many of you have read the book of Titus? Have you read the whole book before? Do you remember what kind of church Titus was leading? Well, I'll tell you. And Titus was sent by Paul to the island of Crete and there was a group of believers there, a church, and it was a really interesting church. Because Paul says, you know what, Titus, I'm sending you there to straighten out what was left unfinished and to appoint elders in every town. Uh, my heart goes out to Titus because uh, Paul hasn't given him an easy job. It, the, Titus is on Creek. It's a place that most people just didn't respect. They kind of look down their noses at them. Remember somebody's told, uh, uh, said about Jesus that he came from Nazareth and thus and good comes from Nazareth? Well, I tell you, Creed had an even worse reputation than Nazareth. Even their own prophets, even their own, their own poets had nothing good to say about Crete, about the place where they were born and, and raised and lived. Listen to how Paul describes it in chapter 1. For there were many rebellious people, full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group, those are the Jewish people. And they must be silenced because they're disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of Crete's own prophets has said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons. And this saying is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in the faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to the merely human commands of those who reject the truth. 
There's a whole lot of characters in that church. And, and it seems that, that there are some Jewish believers there who are saying, you know what, don't listen to all this stuff from Paul. You've got to follow all the rules and all the laws and everything else. And, and you've got to do it perfectly because otherwise God's not going not to accept you. He's going to reject you. And we know as a people because God sent us in exile for 70 years. So you've got to follow all the rules exactly. And then apparently there are some people who are saying all kinds of stuff, and they didn't really care about God or care about the people. All they cared was about getting money. You know, maybe they were asking for offerings, or they are asking them to pay them to teach or, or preach or whatever. So there's all this stuff going on in the church, and Paul says to Titus, hey, you're going to go there and you're going to straighten it all out. And I'm going, ha, oh, good luck. I know my own self, I don't change so easy all the time. And if somebody's going to tell me to change, often my first reaction is to say, no way, I'm fine the way I am. Then my second reaction is to listen and say, yeah, probably there is something. The problem is, these are people now who've accepted Jesus. They've heard the preaching of Paul and of others, and they say, yeah, Jesus is somebody that we really want to, we want to belong to. We want what he offers, forgiveness and, uh, and, and all that stuff. But they haven't allowed Jesus' teaching. They haven't allowed Jesus' death and resurrection to change their lives so basically they're saying, yeah, we believe that, but we're just going to do what we're going to do anyway. We don't want to change. We're happy the way we are. That's why, that's why Paul tells Titus to focus on teaching the gospel. And the gospel, who remembers what, what the gospel is? That goes way back to the beginning of the series. <laughs> Good news. And that's the, that's the literal translation. And the good news is all about Jesus. How, how, how Jesus was sent by God to come, to, to live and to teach and to, to lead us back to God and then to die for our sins and then be resurrected so that, so that we could know that our sins had been forgiven. He took the penalty of our sin on himself. And, and the goal of teaching the gospel is to help them and us today to, as Paul says, say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And then in the next chapter, Paul goes on and says, you know what, Jesus saved us, not because of the righteous things that we have done, because we haven't done any, but because of his mercy for us. So, so really what, what Paul is telling Titus to teach is that, you know what, knowing something isn't enough. Faith is more than just knowing the right things. For faith to be real and to be effective, it actually has to change who we are as people. It has to change our character. It has to change how we live with God and with each other. Sometimes even how we live with ourselves. And it's all about that transformation of heart and life by Jesus. And Paul identifies different groups in the church to kind of focus on and, and how the gospel should shape each of these different groups. So he says, you know what? Older men, you got to teach them to, to, that a good news, gospel-oriented life looks like being temperate, being worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, love, and in endurance. It's about self-discipline. It's about, it's about dignity. It's about living with honor. 
It's not being in control of themselves. Quick to listen, slow to speak, showing wisdom. And, and Paul wants the older men to be sound or, or healthy, is, is the other translation. Healthy in their faith. A, a faith shaped by Jesus and his command to love God with everything that they are, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then to love others, the people around them, their neighbors, as themselves. So, so that their, their faith is outward looking as they're being shaped in their character. They also need to show how. How they stay grounded in the faith. And, and with an attitude of, of love to God and to others during good times, but also during difficult times. I learned how to walk through hard times through the teachings of my paca, my grandfather, and then through wise mentors that I trusted to turn to because I had seen them walk through hard times and hang on to their faith. I saw how their character was strengthened through hard times and and I wanted to be strengthened. I wanted to be better as well as I went through hard times rather than become bitter or angry or, or anything else like that. And I looked to older men on how they did it. And that's what, that's what Paul is, is, is really getting at for Titus, to, to teach the older men, you know what? you got to live lives that others can look up to and learn from. Because that's what we need. That's what the church needs. That's what the community around you needs. You see, our, 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 our values have to be lived out. Our beliefs have to be lived out in how we live. It is unacceptable to say, at any time, do as I say, not as I do. And, you know, we say that sometimes as a joke. But it's not really a joke. Because our values and beliefs are revealed more through how we walk through life than in the words that we say. And for older men, your role in the community is too big. It is too important for you not to, to embrace. Embrace this teaching from Titus, from Paul. And then Paul goes on to the older women and, and the role that they play within the church and the community as well. You know, be reverent in the way that, that they live, not to slander others or to be a slave to wine, but to teach what's good. And holy, that, that idea of being reverent is, is tied with holiness, and, and that's to be set apart by God for, for his use. Living in a right way according to the way that God teaches us and, and reveals to us how, how we should live and who we should be. And, and Paul emphasizes a, a few things especially. Don't slander others. Be gracious in how you talk about others or to others. Your words are really, really powerful. You know, build them up instead of tearing others down and, and, and gossiping. And don't be slaves to wine. I didn't get that one at first. I remember the first time going through, through this passage. And then I thought, about, I thought about my mom and I thought about some other older women that I knew. And, and I saw how it was when all the kids left home. My mom, for a while, had a really hard time with that. Who was she if she wasn't a mother anymore when, she, when her kids didn't need her anymore? And she found she wrestled with, with a, a lack of esteem. You know, she wrestled with boredom. She had poured her life into us as kids and into the foster kids that were into our home. And then when there was no more kids, you know, what do I do? And it seems that some of the older women in the church in Crete 
they had turned to wine. And, and unfortunately, drinking also loosens your tongue in really bad ways. And you end up saying things that you shouldn't say or that later on you wish you hadn't said. You may say things that you feel, but in cruel or mean ways. And, and Titus is saying, use your words for good. And, and now I'm paraphrasing and I'm, I'm reading into it a little bit, but, but that comes from knowing people and that. But, but I can hear Titus going to the older ladies and saying, take a look around. You, your kids may not be at home anymore. But, but look at all the younger women. Look at, at all the kids that are in the church and in the community. There are so many people who need your love, who need your encouragement, who, who need your blessing. There are a lot of young mothers out there who, who would love to have somebody help them in, in learning how to raise and to teach their kids, who need a word of encouragement or, or maybe an hour rest. You know, there is still so much that you have to offer yet. Just because your own kids aren't there, there's a whole community, a whole church filled with, with, with younger women who, who desperately need you in their lives. And they're called to, to urge and encourage the younger women. Be a mentor, be a model to them. The older women can show these younger women how to love their husbands and, and love their children in the 1 Corinthians 13 way of patience and kindness and humility and trust and, and hope and perseverance. Because they've lived it out. You've, you, you've learned it. You've lived it. And, and maybe we haven't always lived it well, but, but we keep on learning. And being a wife and mother isn't easy. It's not always even appreciated. There's a reason they came up with a date called Mother's Day because mothers are so easily just taken for, for granted. Mothers are the ones who do the main raising of the kids, even still today. Most of us learned our, our values and our morals from mom first. Most of us learned the stories of the Bible from mom first. We learn love and commitment from mom first. Now, dads are really, really important. But moms still, even today, are still the ones who are most involved when the children are the youngest in the day-to-day -day raising of, of the kids, even in these changing times where, where men are starting to take up more uh, of, of that role. Women still bear the largest percentage of time in raising the kids. And that means the foundation of our society starts with mothers, with younger mothers. I know some women cringe when they hear the call to be subject to their husbands. And the Greek word is, is actually submit. But we need to hear this through, through the words of Ephesians 5 where, where that whole passage of, of husbands and wives begin with that verse, submit to one another first. Husbands, husbands need to know their wives respect them. Husbands need their wives respect in order to be strong and healthy husbands and fathers who take their responsibilities seriously. Paul knew what psychologists are rediscovering today, that men and women are different. That's why Paul tells, tells uh, husbands, you gotta love your wives. And, and it's, a, it's a love that, is, that, it, that has a connotations of cherish and, 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 and honor and adore. And then Paul doesn't tell wives to love their husbands back. Paul calls wives to honor their husbands, to respect their husbands. Men need, need the women in their lives, need their wives 
to, to, to respect them in order to feel like they're worthy, that, that they're strong enough, that they're good enough. Too many men deal with a lot of self-doubt and they want to be a hero to their wives and, and to their kids, especially to their daughters. And God knows how we're shaped, and that's why he says, you know, women, submit to your husbands. Show them respect. Show them honor. You're going to make stronger husbands. You're going to make more responsible fathers in that way. And, and older women, you have learned that over the years, and, and it's in sharing those things with younger, younger mothers, younger wives, that you can help them be, be better wives and, and then their husbands be better husbands and, and fathers. You know, this isn't just being taught just because there's a hierarchy or whatever, but, but Paul's teaching what he's learned from God in terms of how we're created, of, of how we grow stronger, of how we be better in terms of, of who we are. And, and when people outside the church see how younger men and, and younger women, you know, they have mentors and models who really care and, and, and invest in them, building, building strong adults and families, they, they find it hard and difficult to blaspheme God. Because how can you make fun of, of the church's God when, 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 when you have all this support and this encouragement and this teaching and this walking alongside, this mentoring and this modeling and, 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 and what's coming out of it is strong and, and healthy and, and powerful families and, and you have children who are growing up secure in, in who they are and, and they know who they are and, 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 and they're not afraid they're never afraid because they know of their parents and how they live together and, and they see how, how, how Oma and Opa and Pa and Beppa and Grandma and Grandpa and others in the church are, are, are caring about their family and, and, and helping them and walking alongside them. It's amazing how, how that helps our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids grow up to be strong and, and healthy as well. How do you mock something like that? You can't. Even if people don't accept God, they look at the church, and when a church is operating this way, they kind of go, wow. And that's why Paul is teaching you, telling Titus to teach you things, telling young men as well to, to, to be self-controlled. And they learn self-control by, by watching their fathers, by watching the older men in the church. And then Paul tells Titus, you know, you have to live the same way. You have to be a mentor as well. You got to show integrity and, and seriousness and, and soundness of, of speech. You know, you can't be telling everybody else in the church on how to live unless you model it in your own life as well. And that's why, as a pastor, I have elders and deacons who, who walk alongside me, who who I'm responsible to, who I hope will tell me when I'm messing up and, I, and I'm not being true to the word and to who I'm supposed to be as well. I'm hoping older men in the congregation as well will sit down with me at times and say, you know what, you can be a better person. You can be a better husband or pastor. You know, if you would, if you would do this or if you would change that. See, it's one thing to read about how God wants us to live as a witness for him. It's another to watch somebody who's doing it. You know, that's how I've learned, and I know that's how many of us learn as well. There's something inspiring about watching the life of someone who's living out their faith in, in beautiful, generous ways, watching how they practice self-control and, and Christian character and, and joy and love and more and all their relationships in their families and in their church and, and in their community, in their workplaces and in school. And it inspires others and, and it gives us the courage and strength to live the same way as well which increases our witness to the gospel and, and Jesus. And our children and our youth and our community are watching us. They're, they're, they're seeing if we say 
if what we say we believe is being practiced. And this is why Paul mentions how even a slave can be a witness in how he or she does their master's bidding, also that in every way they'll make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. See, our lives, we've been given these lives to live in such a way that, that others in the community go, wow. You know what? We may, not, we may not believe in your Jesus, but wow, what a difference he makes in your life. And you know what? I want to be more like you because of how you live with, with everybody else. You know, have you ever thought that you're a witness to your boss? Or that as students, you can be a witness to your teacher? That's true. You can. And it happens often. That's why Paul reminds us in another letter to to do everything as if we're doing it for the Lord. Because it gets noticed. And, And that's why... That's why Paul sends Titus to Crete. Because if these people, these Cretans, if they can be transformed by by the gospel news, that can show the world that anybody can be transformed. Anybody can be can be can be changed by by accepting Jesus. Any community can grow in health and can flourish when more and more people in the community come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So following Jesus, teaching and encouraging each other in who Jesus is calling us to be as individuals and as a church, it shapes who we are. It shapes how we live together as families as church, and as a community. And it shapes us so that our teaching about Jesus is attractive. So that people go, yeah, that's what I want. Drawing people to Jesus. So through God's grace, we say no to ungodliness as we wait for Jesus' return. And as we, we do the good that God has prepared for us beforehand, to do, to create healthy families, healthy communities that reflect Jesus' teaching in life, a place where everyone is able to flourish in the gifts that God has given us. Amen. Lord, thank you. Thank you for, for, for shaping our communities and for shaping us so that so that we can continually learn and, 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 and use our life skills to teach others, that, that, that we don't walk alone, but, but you place us in communities, in churches that, that bless us and help us to become more and more who you've called us to be, that, that you help us to live as a community, to make Jesus attractive, to others as you are so attractive to us. So Lord, shape us and form us. Lord, may we take our roles and responsibilities seriously so that we can be a strong, blessed community for you and for all those around us. Amen. In response, let's sing, God is here.
seated. As part of being a church, we partner with others to, to expand God's kingdom. And our offering this morning is for Leah Evans, and Leah is going to, has sent a video to explain her, uh, uh, her work for us so that we know what, uh, how we're partnering with her. So let's just watch and... Uh... Hey Bethel CRC, it is so good to kind of be there with you today. And it's so fun to be able to share this opportunity of what the Lord's leading me into this year. As you guys are the church that I grew up in, the church that introduced me to Jesus. And so I just really hope that this blesses you. Because, yeah, this job is really important to me because over the past few years, um, I've been involved in youth ministry. This is now my fourth year. And it's exciting to be able to continue on the journey of like introducing teens to Jesus and like getting to walk through the hard stuff and the good stuff and watching him work in their hearts and just like the healing that he can offer them and it's encouraging for me to watch firsthand but I'm so excited to be able to share those stories with you and be able to encourage you as a church family with those and to hear what the Lord's doing and so to break my job down into four different points uh, the first one is South End Youth our church has a youth group that I'm a part of and yeah, I have my small group and I get to speak for them sometimes. And so it's just a fun thing to be a part of. The second one is outreach. My coworker and I have a big heart for the things that happen on the downtown east side and being able to introduce teens to poverty and what happens and where the Lord's heart is there. And the third one is liaison. And so we have Christian kids in public schools and we meet with them and we pray with them for their schools. And from there, we meet their non-Christian friends and we start different groups and start discipling their friends. And yeah, hopefully just keep introducing kids to Jesus because I mean, we wanna build his kingdom here. And so that's kind of the heart with that. And the fourth one is fundraising. And fundraising might take the most faith because it takes faith for me to be able to ask the people who I feel like God is calling into this ministry. And it takes faith for the person that's being asked to trust that what they're giving to is going to be used to build God's kingdom. And it's going to be used for his work. And so I just want to say thank you, first of all, for um, taking part in that and giving what you what God has given to you. And if giving is something that you want to keep doing or you want to do again sometime, um, the number that's on this screen it will take you directly to my giving link. And so, yeah, to finish off, I just wanna pray a blessing over this church from Ephesians 3. It says that, I pray out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know that this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Yeah, thank you, church, and I'll see you soon. So let's pray for, uh, for Leah and the work uh, that God has called her to. Um, Lord, thank you for allowing us to partner with Leah in the work she's doing with uh, youth in her own church, uh, youth in the Christian and the public schools, um, and in the discipleship uh, that she is engaged in uh, leading teens and, and youth to, to you. Uh, so Lord, we pray that our offering for her will, uh, will help her to do the work that you have called her to do in changing these young lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And before we uh, go to God's blessing and a closing song, A Mighty Fortress uh, is Our God, that great Reformation hymn, uh, just a, a few announcements. Um, I'm holding over the next four Sunday evenings a mental health course. Uh, it's called Let's Talk, and it's through the Christian Reformed Church. Um, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the news uh, 
uh, or to the radio uh, or, or even listening within the community, but, but mental health uh, needs are growing and growing and growing. Uh, the longer this time uh, goes on of COVID and fear and anxiety and that, uh, the more and more people are being affected. So this is a four-week course. Um, be about an hour, hour and a half uh, each, uh, each evening. Um, it's just to, to, to help us understand a little bit more about mental health uh, and then how to walk alongside. Uh, it doesn't teach you how to counsel or anything else, but to help recognize uh, when somebody may be struggling uh, and then how to come alongside as a friend um, and, and as, a, as a listener uh, who has a little bit of knowledge of what they may be coming to, uh, going through. So uh, this afternoon, you can, oh, you can drop me an email and I can send you the, uh, the course packet uh, and then I can also send you the Zoom link for, uh, uh, for the course uh, for, for this evening as well. And then there's Rehoboth Forms. We, uh, we support Rehoboth. Uh, and again, that's all tied in with, uh, with Friendship Group. You can pick up those forms there. And then on Friday and Saturday, November 6th and 7th, um, our church along with uh, Wolf Creek Church is hosting a, uh, uh, a weekend where we can learn about reconciliation, indigenous people in the church. Um, Having been in Ontario and having lived in, uh, in the East Coast, seeing what's going on in Southern Ontario and seeing what's happening with the lobster fisheries uh, going on, it's, um, these are both areas I've lived in and I worked uh, one season in the lobster uh, uh, fishery on a lobster boat as well. There's so much brokenness. There is so much hurt um, all over the place. And, uh, and Perry Stelter, he's a, uh, a pastor, a member of Hope Church in Stony Plain. Uh, he has Word of Hope Ministries, and, and his great desire is to, is to help uh, in bring indigenous people and, uh, and non-indigenous people together to learn from and with each other. So you have that opportunity on a Friday and Saturday, um, November 6th and 7th, and uh, just connect with, uh, with Jan or Yakoba, um, and they can get you registered and share a little bit more uh, about it as well. I think that's all the announcements. Is there anything else going on you should know about? Uh, when you're gone a week, it's amazing what you how quickly get out of loop. Oh. I ask you then to stand for God's blessing and then closing with that mighty Reformation hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Oh. Dave Encouragement is on the 7th. Oh, yes. Dave Encouragement as well is on the 7th, and that's going to be a Zoom conference uh, uh, this, uh, this year. So. So go now in the righteousness of faith and live by God's just demands. Let nothing claim your devotion above the Lord and count nothing of value above knowing Christ. And press on towards the ultimate prize of being one with him. And may God's perfect word revive your soul. May Christ Jesus be your savior and your rock. And may the Holy Spirit strengthen you to press ever onward and go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.